Good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues. My name is Jane Sanchez. I serve as Deputy Librarian for Library Collections and Services at the Library of Congress. And I also have a dual role. I also serve as the 25th Law Librarian of Congress. I'd like to extend a warm, hearty, virtual welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining the Law Library of Congress and the Greater Library for the 2019-2020 Frederick R. and Molly S. Kellogg Biennial Lecture on Jurisprudence. The Law Library of Congress is a very busy institution, even now more so during COVID. As an organization, the Law Library is unique in that it stands as the primary resource for research for the US Congress in foreign, comparative, and international law. We spend our days in the midst of law in a very practical, operational way. We conduct legal research for Congress and for congressional staff and for other branches of the US government. We provide resources and services for the public, in addition, both nationally and globally. In addition to research, our is to sustain and preserve a universal collection of law for future generations. Over the past 188 years, we've grown to be the largest law library in the world, maintaining the most comprehensive collection of law books and resources from around the world. Collecting, organizing, maintaining, and servicing our collections which are over 2.9 million volumes and about 3 million pieces of micro formats is no small task and one that consumes a great deal of our time and attention. We also deal with the application of jurisprudence in its practical operational way on a daily basis. The Kellogg Biennial Lecture Program brings another dimension to us here at the Law Library. It takes us back to the theoretical grounding of our trade and emphasizes the original significance of jurisprudence, the study and theory of law. It allows us to indulge in a scholarly program about contemporary legal thought through presentations of internationally prominent contributors to the science of jurisprudence, judged through their writings, reputation, broad and continuing influence on contemporary legal scholarship. Today's event would not have been possible without Fred and Molly Kellogg. It is their generous endowment that brought this important series to the Library of Congress. We are most grateful. I would also like to acknowledge Professor Don Wallace and Mark Medish, who have been very helpful with the planning of today's lecture. At this time, Please join me in welcoming Mr. Frederick R. Kellogg, who will introduce our speaker and our interviewer. Fred, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I'm Frederick Kellogg, and I have the honor to introduce our speakers. First, I want to thank those who have made this series and lecture possible, especially the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, the Law Librarian, Jane Sanchez, who we just heard, their assistants, Donna Sokol and Robert Brammer, and importantly, the two independent jurors, Don Wallace and Mark Medish, who along with the law librarians select the biennial lecture. Their work and this year's arrangements have been challenging, and we are delighted to welcome all who are in attendance by Zoom. In two years, we hope to return to a lecture at the actual library itself. And believe me, it will have a celebratory reception for attendees. So please come back in 2022. 11 years ago, the Library of Congress, then under librarian Jim Billington, accepted a proposal by Molly and me to support and endow a series of lectures on jurisprudence and the philosophy of law. I felt the need for a national and international forum on this, our legal philosophy, but another inspiration was Molly Kellogg's 30 years of service on Capitol Hill as executive assistant 
to Congressman J.J. Pickle of Austin, Texas. Those were days when opposing members treated each other with remarkable courtesy and respect. Those days will return, but not without effort and reflection, which brings me to our lectures. The first lecture in 2009 was by Ronald Dworkin on whether there is truth in interpretation. Two years later, Joseph Roz delivered the second lecture titled Sovereignty and Legitimacy on the Changing Face of Law. In 2013, Amartya Sen delivered Justice, Disagreement, and Objectivity. And in 2015, Michael Sandel spoke on justice, neutrality, and law, focusing on whether the law should affirm certain moral judgments or be neutral on moral and spiritual questions. Our last lecture was presented in 2017 by Jeremy Waldron on the philosophical foundations of immigration law. Professor Mar Martha Nussbaum, as you can see from her extraordinary background, has brought a humane and learned voice to a diversity of issues in philosophy, public policy, and law. Our lecturer holds several academic appointments as Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics, appointed in the Law School and Philosophy Department, as an associate in the Classics Department, the Divinity School, and the Political Science Department and as a member of the Co Committee on Southern Asian Studies and a board member of the Human Rights Program. She holds honorary degrees from 63 colleges and universities and several important prizes, the Prince of Asturias Prize in the Social Sciences, the American Philosophical Association Philip Quinn Prize, the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy, the Don M. Randall Prize for Achievement in the Humanities from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Bur Bruin Prize for Philosophy and Culture. The list of her books is very long, so I will refer you to Wikipedia and mention just a few to demonstrate her truly extraordinary reach. In 2013, she published Political Emotions, Why Love Matters for Justice. In 2016, Anger and Forgiveness, Resentment, Generosity, Justice. In 2018, The Monarchy of Fear, a philosopher looks at our political crisis. Her new book, Citadels of Pride, Sexual Abuse, Accountability and Reconciliation will be published in 2021. And she is currently working on a book on justice for non-human animals. I should also mention her teaching ability, so important to her and to any academic career. She holds the University of Chicago Faculty Award for excellence in graduate teaching. My final introduction and deep thanks go to Professor of Philosophy Brian Butler of the University of North Carolina, Asheville, who will interview Professor Nussbaum on philosophy and life, fragility, emotions, and capabilities. Brian studied with her at Chicago Law School. He is a preeminent legal scholar and the author in 2017 of The Democratic Constitution, Experimentalism and Interpretation. Now, I turn the virtual podium over to our speakers. Brian. Thanks, Fred. Uh, it's re really great to be here um, with Fred and Molly's lecture series and with Martha, people I really do admire. Um, so I think we should just get right on with the interview, if that's okay, Martha. Um, I would like to start uh, with your philosophical methodology, I think, um, and to ask a question about that. Um, through Fragility of Goodness, Poetic Justice, and Monarchy of Fear, you used a, a real breadth of texts of information, and when I was uh, emailing back and forth with you about this, I described you as a public intellectual, and you said very certainly you wanted to be described as a philosopher, which I greatly appreciate. Um, so I just would like to, to, to say uh, exactly, um, would you explain uh, the, your philosophical methodology and what your conception of philosophy is? Okay, so thank you. First of all, I want to thank the library and thank Fred and Molly Kellogg very much for making this event possible and thank Brian especially for being willing to 
be my interlocutor in this interview and for the wonderful questions that he's come up with. Well, I mean, I do very much want to be considered as a philosopher. Actually, my PhD was in classics, so I guess I've had to fight to get into the philosophy world. And um, I find it a very precious world where rigor of argument, respectful criticism, and all the virtues that are so lacking in some of our public life are still honored. So um, what, though, what Brian's really asking about is that in my work, I've used literary texts and to some extent also musical texts. I'll talk about that later. In thinking about philosophical questions. Now, so why do I do that? Well, you know, ever since high school, I've been fascinated by Greek tragedy. I was an actress for a while and I acted in some Greek tragedies, actually even as a professional actress. And um, those plays always seemed to me to offer deep human insight. But there was a debate about them and this interested me because Plato understood that the tragic poets were teachers of people and that they offered people insights, but he thought that the insights were false and pernicious and led people astray and pernicious not just because of certain claims that were made within the place, but because the whole tragic form, the genre itself, told lies. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, tragedies show a person who's not a bad person, pretty good person, coming to grief in spectacular ways through events that that person largely does not control. So to believe that tragedy offers insight, you have to believe that good people can be harmed by things beyond their control, that we're vulnerable in very deep ways, that, for example, the loss of, a, of citizenship, the loss of a husband, the loss of children, that these are really big things that can affect the well-being of a person in, in very significant ways. Plato thought that that was totally false, that the only thing that was of real importance was your moral purpose or character, and that was always within your own control. So the citizens in his ideal city would not see such works, and they would never hear these people saying, oh, terrible, and rolling around in the dust because they've lost somebody that they cared about. Now, he was very similar in this respect to the Greek Stoics who came later, and later too in my career, because I didn't know much about them at that time. And the Stoics actually offered a definition of tragedy. So this is how tragedy comes about, when chance events befall fools. And once again, they thought it was not just what was asserted within the tragedy, but it's the way that play shapes your attention. It makes you care about the hero and then deeply grieve and feel emotions such as compassion and fear for that hero. Well, of course, not every philosopher agrees with Plato that these are false insights. Aristotle largely thinks that they're true. And so there comes to be a debate, which is a debate not just about propositions within the works, but about the form itself, whether it offers human insight. So in my first book, The Fragility of Goodness, I wrote about that and I said, look, here we have a real debate between literature and philosophy. And it's not just like colleagues in different departments peacefully talking in their own way. And then later I extended this and I thought about other areas in which this idea applies that form itself has, a, has a, as it were, a content. Uh, I thought about the Aristotelian philosophical claim that ethical attention is very contextual very particularistic. And well, of course, Aristotle can say this, but to really assess that claim, to see what you make of it, it's very helpful to consider the form of the novel, which shows, and particular novels, my particular interest was Henry James and Proust, because those characters attend in the way that Aristotle describes, and the novel is able to show that fine-tuned attention taking shape. So I wrote a good deal about that. And then later, as I came to be teaching in a law school, I saw that the same issue happens within law. Judges who just read the texts of black letter law miss something about human beings that literature is able to show them. So I've written a good deal about that. And we've had a whole project of conferences on law and literature where we've published, we're now our sixth 
edited collection is coming out soon. And the, the sixth one is a good example, war in law and literature. Well, how do you learn about war if you don't get close to the people and have a sense of what their bodies are suffering, then you miss something that law, lawyers and judges really need to know about war. And here's where I find that music too is very important. And in my contribution to this volume, I use Benjamin Britten's War Requiem because music can go beyond literary words to actually make us feel the cutting of the body by, you know, cutting of, of steel into flesh and the bangings and the clangings in that work show us the, the terrible horror of war and then ask us to deliberate. What, what do we want to do about that? Uh, of course, Britain was a total pacifist, I'm not, but anyway, we, we agree that something very terrible happens to the human body that we better deliberate well about. So, so that's the kind of terrain I've been covering and I'm moving, I would guess, more and more in the direction of music because it just is such a passionate part of my life. But anyway, I think those works need the commentary that philosophy offers. I don't think we should throw out philosophy and turn to literature and music instead. No, of course not, because we need the rigorous analysis of what these things uh, bring in. But, uh, but in any case, I've, I've turn to texts that a lot of philosophers don't don't turn to. Is that and that's great. It's 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 great to read that and to see that even say for instance non-propositional knowledge is something real interesting the way you've been working with that. Um, but I do um, insist that that philosophy needs to be there too because you know we can't we don't have a view on the table that we can assess until we have the contribution of the philosopher. So, you know, some philosophers like Plato could put the literary inside their philosophy because they were actually gifted literary authors. Aristotle wasn't, so he just turned to real literary authors. I think Proust is someone who's kind of a hybrid figure. He can uh, talk philosophically in one part of the work, but then he offers you the literary material in another part of the work. But in any case, you, you really need two different sorts of things, the emotion-inspiring work and then the philosophical commentary. Great, thank you. Uh, when we were emailing back and forth, you, you said something quite interesting. You said your, your methods do not change, but your substantive views do. And so I thought that that was interesting. We could focus on a couple places where they changed. And one of the places you said they changed was cosmopolitanism. Um, and you, you've analyzed it quite effectively as something that's, that has great virtues, but also has blind spots. Then you were intrigued by or, or worried by how it fits with, say, um, liberalism, uh, as well as with the nation state. And I just, if you would just play that out for us a little bit, I think we'd all appreciate it. Yeah, okay. First about the general point. I guess I notice uh, as I go through life that philosophers often dig in and get identified with a particular view and they get very upset and they want to do down their opponents. But I think, you know, you should always be wanting to be challenged. That's why I have such wonderful colleagues in the law school because they never tell me, oh, that's a great paper, but they always tell me why I'm wrong. And, you know, I think you're not alive unless you're ready to be told that you're wrong by others and then just feel it in yourself and, and to move forward. But in any case, um, yeah, cosmopolitanism, I started working on a very long time ago. And this book, The Cosmopolitan Tradition, has been a very long time in the making, during which I really have changed my views. Now, I define cosmopolitanism as the view that one should always give one's first loyalty to the whole of humanity wherever it is, and then only secondarily care about your own nation, your own family, and so forth. So that's something that I wrote about back in around, oh, 1994 in a piece in the Boston Review that was part of a debate on patriotism and cosmopolitanism. And I, every year I'm brought up with the, the change in my views in a somewhat painful way because people write to me 
and they asked me if they can reprint that piece where I really agreed with the cosmopolitan position. And, uh, you know, actually, I say oh, you can reprint it only if you describe the change in my views and refer to later work. But of course, often people do not ask permission if they want to reprint something. So I come to a campus and I find somebody has a seminar about Nussbaum, the cosmopolitan, and then I have to say, rack, rack, you're wrong about that. Why did you think that one op-ed told you what I think? So actually, the cosmopolitan view, I think, has many great virtues. It's the origin, basically, of our modern human rights movement. All human beings deserve respect, and they deserve a measure of concern no matter where they are. So, so that's good in many ways. It's brought us forward from where we used to be. But there are, I guess, basically four things that I find wrong with this tradition that I investigate, starting with the Greek and Roman Stoics. First of all, they were very concerned with respect. And so we have very strict duties not to let human beings be insulted in their dignity and so on which translates into a very strict set of laws about the initiation and resolution of war. And I think those, that's been a tremendous contribution to the modern world. The, the whole law of war is already in Cicero. Uh, but they didn't talk about material need very much. They couldn't figure it out. They, they thought it's so amorphous. Who would you give your money to? And how would you do that all over the world? You, you could see how you would try to stop armed conflict all over the world or have it go ahead on just presuppositions. But, but they couldn't think well about material need. And so it was only very gradually, and I trace this in Hugo Grotius, Adam Smith, and later people who thought, well, look here, if we don't have war, but we can't get anything to eat, that's not a very good situation. And it does look like human dignity is undermined just as much by hunger, by lack of education, which is, of course, another material need, by lack of health care, as it is by war. And so why separate the two? Now, in my own views, which we'll talk about later, I, I do not separate the two. But our modern human rights tradition very much does. They're the first generation rights, which are the ones connected with the duties of justice, and then if material duties come into it at all, duties to promote health, duties to promote uh, adequate uh, living standard and so on, it's very much in the second place. So one thing that the tradition itself does is to address that problem and it gradually, gradually works on it, but it's still a very difficult problem. The second problem is that the nation shouldn't be neglected. This is, some, this is where I think I did neglect it. I was tired of me first uh, patriotism, you know, the flag waving kind. And I didn't sufficiently reflect on what is special about the nation. Namely, it's the place where we, and I think it's the largest place where we people get a chance to give ourselves laws of our own choosing. Therefore, it's a source of the very important good of autonomy, which really does mean the right to give yourself laws of your own choosing. And it's accountable to us in a way that, let's face it, if there were a world state, it, it wouldn't possibly be. Even the EU has had tremendous problems of accountability. But I can tell you, having worked many years in the United Nations agency, there's no accountability in the UN. So, you know, the nation has problems. There are issues of accountability, as we know, grappling with voting right now. But in principle, if things are done well, the nation is ours and it is accountable to us. And so I feel that the nation is a special thing. Cicero already saw that, by the way. He was a great patriot for the Roman Republic. So, you know, I think he was right to say that we're entitled to give our own nation a special measure of our concern. And therefore, the duties to other nations ought to flow from our duty to the nation. And it should be the nation, in the first instance, that performs those transnational duties. Now, some people, of course, a lot of people disagree with that. But that's what I currently think. Another problem that I came upon later 
is the problem that John Rawls makes the topic of his second great book called Political Liberalism. Rawls said that in a pluralistic society, we cannot prescribe one comprehensive doctrine of how to live for all the different people who differ by religion or sometimes secular comprehensive doctrines like utilitarianism, Marxism, any modern society contains all of those. So therefore political principles, if they are to provide a, as it were, convergence place for all these different people, Protestants, Catholics, utilitarians, etc., must be rather narrow and non-metaphysical, just sort of thin ethical principles that we can all agree to in what Rawls came to call an overlapping consensus. Now, I hadn't thought about that when I started to work on cosmopolitanism. And of course, cosmopolitanism, as I define it, is a comprehensive doctrine. So I think that we must not prescribe that as a doctrine that everyone should agree to. Because, you know, each person's religion will have different relation to that. A lot of religions think you owe special duties to your own co-religionists. And so I think what we ought to say is that duties to care for people in other parts of the world are a part of what we could make the object of, of an overlapping consensus. But it can't be in that strong, comprehensive form. We have to think, what is, what is it that we can recommend to everyone? And then, finally, and here is the real clincher, I think, it's the, the problem that breaks the back of the tradition, it is a form of humanism. It is like the human dignity of all human beings is what it's about. And they had a lot to say about why that should be true, because human beings are special, because we're moral and we're rational and so on. And in the process, they totally pretty much neglected any duties we might have about the environment, so not even duties about that, but they certainly didn't have duties that showed respect for non-human animals, which to me is a big, big failing. These other sentient beings with whom we share this world into which we're thrown, they are sentient too, and they're very, very intelligent. And we abuse them every day if we eat, meat and so on. So anyway, that those, as those issues came to occupy my mind more and more, I came to have doubts whether cosmopolitanism could even be a decent starting point for global duties, because whatever our global duties are, I think the cosmopolitan can agree that we better care about global warming, because that pertains to human beings. But they cannot hold that we should care about animals as worthy of concern in their own right. And so to me, that was the, 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 the as it were, straw that broke the back of the tradition and, and led me to think we need a, a replacement. And, and so the replacement or the way you critique it um, is with a, your version of the capabilities approach, which I find incredibly significant and so important in, as a philosophical, as a, as a analysis of international and national justice. So um, in say creating capabilities and women and human development, um, would you kind of fill that critique in? With... Yeah, okay. Now, first I wanna say this is a, a group effort. Uh, I did the initial work on this in collaboration. I was very lucky to have as a collaborator, the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen. And by now there's an international association, the Human Development and Capability Association. You can find it online and there are over a thousand official members but many many more people in over a hundred nations that are working on these ideas and as is very important I think they each have their own view not everyone has my view Amartya and I have significant differences both in what we're doing with the view and in specific disagreements within it and uh, there are other people who write about it who have still other views so Basically, the, the common ground is, and it began with some problems in development economics. When nations were compared in the old days and rated as to how, what is their living standard, how well are they doing, they used to be compared by gross domestic product per capita alone. 
And if you think about that, that simple measure, I mean, it's attractive because you can measure it and it's easy to measure, but it uh, conceals many other problems. First of all, it's an aggregate and therefore it conceals distributional inequalities within each nation. So it could give very high marks to a nation that had very high average GDP, but had staggering inequalities. So to give you an example of that, in the old days when that measure was used, South Africa under apartheid used to shoot to the top of the table of developing countries because with all its riches and its resources, it was very rich in terms of GDP per capita, even though 90% of its people had no share in that wealth at all. And of course, there are many different kinds of inequality, racial, gender-based, and, and so forth, that are completely occluded by that aggregate measure. Another problem it has, because it's an aggregate, is it doesn't separate the different parts of human life, which are all quite important and not commensurable with each other. One part that is important is, of course, having enough to live on, that, that is important, but health, education, the ability to move freely from place to place, the ability to speak your views without being tossed into prison, the ability to have some leisure time when you can play and exercise your imagination. All of these and others are important aspects of human life that are not always well correlated with GDP, even when you adjust for distribution. Because there's things that nations do when they're shooting for growth alone that don't address the healthcare needs of people. I mean, our nation is a brilliant example of, not so brilliant example of that, that we do very well, second in the world to Luxembourg on GDP per capita. But, you know, look at the healthcare problems that we have. No guarantees for anyone of healthcare and staggering inequalities in healthcare. There are also problems in education. If you compare different Indian states, some Indian states have, because education is a subject that's handled by the state government, not the national government, the average in India is about 65% literacy for men, 50 for women. There are some states that have 100% literacy for both men and women in adolescent years. What have they done? I mean, it's not because they're richer, because actually they don't have the highest GDP. It's because of specific state-initiated policies that target that particular issue. So these states in India, particularly Kerala and Tamil Nadu, have very wonderful and well-known results in both health and education because of what the government has done to create a health and educational infrastructure. So that's, in short, the reason that we need to disaggregate look at things separately. Now, another thing you might try if you were not still, you weren't happy with GDP, but you wanted a single number, would be the satisfaction of preference considered as a single number. And that's what a lot of utilitarian economists did for a while. But again, that has the same two problems. It's an aggregate, and so it doesn't take account of distributional problems and it funnels all the different satisfactions into one bucket. And so you don't get the disaggregation of the different parts of the life. So what we said is, look, it may be messier, but it's important to be more true and more close to what, where people are living. I, I like to say that my version of the capabilities approach, I feel like a lawyer who's been retained by activists who were seeking for a better living standard for poor people. And I've done a lot of work in, uh, with women's development projects in India. And so I like to think, well, you know, I can walk into the World Bank and say, this is the right approach. They can't do that. So I'm their lawyer, as it were, arguing on their behalf. But it's what people really are striving for. They want, people want to be able to do things that they care about. And so the capabilities that a person has are substantive freedoms to choose to do things to which you ascribe value in your life. Now that is very broad, and then we have to get more refined about which capabilities we're paying attention to. But that's what Sen and I agree on, that we think this is the right space of comparison. If we're going to compare, 
we have to compare in a pertinent way, in a way that's pertinent to people's lives. And then in the human de development reports of the UN development program, Amartya did single out certain specific capabilities, education and health related as the important ones. But then what I've done is to go more onto the philosophical terrain and try to turn this into a minimal theory of justice, like a template for making a constitution, if you will. It's uh, to say, here are, and I have this list, I, I guess I should have been able to put it on the screen. I'm, I'm so technologically inept, but anyway, a list of 10 capabilities, things that people ought to be able to do up to a certain minimal threshold level if a nation is to lay claim to even minimal justice. And so then I argue that this approach is pertinent not only for comparative development economics, but it helps us have a theory of justice that does well by the claims of people who are particularly likely to be marginalized by theories of justice that don't pay attention to persistent inequalities, such as people with disabilities I've talked about and, and so on. So anyway, that's my approach and it's developed as a political theory in keeping with roles in political liberalism. It's a partial political theory of, of, of principles that I would say could be the object of an overlapping consensus, first at the nation level, and then let's hope in international society as we all try to figure out how the different nations of the world can cooperate together. Now that really is what I've been doing in first in women and human development and I focused on women because the issue of women in developing countries interests me, but it's also a very good litmus test for theories because theories like a GDP theory don't even get to the point of stating the problems that women have in developing countries lack of access to literacy, lack of access to health, and so on. And uh, so it shows you more general things about the theory. And then I wrote another book, Frontiers of Justice, where I tried to show that this theory does a little bit better than even Rawls's great theory in areas such as justice for people with disabilities, so where there are staggering inequalities and the people are held not to be equally rational, which is another big problem. And then in the last uh, chapter of that book, I talked about non-human animals, which was my first foray into that terrain. And then in 2012, I wrote a book that's, that was less densely philosophical. It was more available to students, to political practitioners, to human rights practitioners, creating capabilities. And I, there I tried to state my view, but I also tried to say, here are the differences between my view and Amartya Sen's view. And I also did something else. There's a movement in economics called the human capital approach. James Heckman, who also, he won the Nobel Prize a little later than Amartya did, has been a wonderful cooperate, collaborator with me at the University of Chicago. And his view is a little bit different from mine, but it's often confused with it because he uses the word capabilities. So I also wanted to tell people what Heckman's up to and what are the points of agreement and disagreement. Uh, so, you know, that's what I've been up to, basically. And uh, we have every year a meeting of the Human Development and Capability Association. And we have a lot, I want to have more argument. I want to have more people coming there who challenge our approach, who don't agree with it, but within the association itself. And one way that I have stirred things up is in this defense of the entitlements of non-human animals. Because I get attacked, and that's the biggest change in my own view, um, I get attacked from both sides. We have this group of philosophers and, and development people who are working on animals. And my daughter, who died last year, was a lawyer for the rights of animals. And so she gave papers also at, this, at this, uh, these meetings. Um, so some people think that I'm right to think that non-human animals deserve certain capability-based entitlements. Some people think that's too much. We should put all humans first and the urgent needs of human beings should always take precedence and they actually get annoyed with me sometimes because they think I've kind of given up on 
human poverty by taking such an interest in animal well-being. But then from the other side, there are people who think that, no, it's ecosystems that we ought to care about. We should jettison the concern with individual sentient beings, and we should just go over to a more holistic approach where what we're promoting is ecosystems. And that, that's a very interesting challenge for me. And I, I really love the challenge. I, I do feel still, that I, I, I haven't given up on individual sentient beings because I do think that suffering of indi is an individual matter and not getting to do what you really, really want to do, which is the core of the capabilities approach, that's kind of the core of injustice is being thwarted in your striving after the most valuable things in your life. So I, I, I've not been convinced, but I love the debate. It's always been great to read your work and to watch you analyze because the rigor combined with the, the courage to advocate for positions is something that I think is pretty rare. And so thank you for that. And I think in the, your version of the capabilities approach shows that combination um, uh, as much as anybody else, if not a lot more. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'd like to, to move to uh, one more place before we go into the future maybe, and that's the, your philosophy of emotion. Most specifically, um, your, your work on anger, um, which seems uh, pretty much ubiquitous today. <laughs> a lot of angry people in the world. Um, and and your, your, your work on anger, I think, is, is quite challenging, right? So, for instance, in anger and forgiveness and the monarchy of fear, I mean, you really have some strong, um, courageous claims to do with anger. So uh, I, I'd love for you to play that out for us. Plus, it's an area where I think you, you said you have changed. And yeah, so yeah. Well, that I mean, well. I, I didn't, it's not like the other one, because I hadn't really written very much about anger. I had written about somehow all these emotions that I particularly liked, like compassion, love, and then I did write about disgust because I thought it was a particularly challenging one for democracy and particularly dangerous one. And then I wrote about fear in the monarchy of fear. But anger, I had just sort of passed it by, but in passing I had said, well, I think justified anger is an ally in the pursuit of justice. But you know, I never had sat down and actually analyzed the emotion and tried to figure out what its different parts are. So when I was invited to give the Locke lectures in Oxford, I thought that was a good topic. I'd better figure out what I actually think about anger. And I remember just sitting there in my office, you know, and here was a case where I wasn't actually being pushed by an opponent, but I was just pushing myself. And, and I noticed this, that all the definitions of anger, both in Western philosophy and actually also in Indian philosophy, which is the only non-Western tradition that I know much about, have their two parts to anger. First of all, there's the pain that's connected with believing that you've been wronged in some significant way by somebody else, and wrong, wronged meaning the person didn't have a right to do it. It was a wrongful damage. Okay, that's one part. And I think if your beliefs are all correct about who wronged you, how significant it was, and so on, that's the part that is okay in the sense that it's good for people to notice when they're wrong. And it's good for them to make a big deal about that and say that had better not happen again to protest it. But all the definitions add something else, namely the desire for retributive payback. Every single definition says that the angry person also feels pleased at the thought that they're going to get the better of the person who hurt them. And you know, it, it's, it, you can't ignore it. It is ubiquitous. It's not just a mistake. And I actually think it's very human. Uh, I think most of the time when we're wrong, we really do want to strike back. It's probably evolutionary. And even if we don't want to go out and take revenge ourselves, we think that the law should do that for us. If a child has been killed, the parents, they want the law to inflict capital punishment as a kind of proportional payback. And, you know, even if you don't do anything at all, you kind of wish that the person who wronged you would suffer. So let's say you 
get divorced and you feel betrayed, you find yourself wishing that that person who betrayed you would turn out badly, that that second marriage would be very, very bad. And, you know, it's just a very human thing to think. But what I found myself concluding as I sat there in my office is that ubiquitous and human though it is, it's empty and da damaging because payback doesn't actually make up for the thing you lost. It never does. I mean, capital punishment never gives you your child back again. And if you have had some other kind of damage to your reputation or whatever, inflicting humiliation on the person who damaged you does not give you back the thing that you lost. So your thought is a kind of fantasy. The idea that ret retribution fixes things is a fantasy. And it's a fantasy we all have, but I think we had better get rid of it. And it usually makes things a lot worse for everyone. So let's think of divorce again. The litigation that people get themselves into as they try to inflict proportional payback, it makes their lives go worse in the future usually because they become obsessive, unpleasant, and then the children suffer with these terrible disputes about custody. So anyway, I found myself thinking, what is the point of all this? Now, I have to say that personally, I've always had an aversion to retributive anger in my own personal life. And I didn't really want to say that this was the correct philosophical position because I thought, well, maybe that's just because of some quirk about me. And there were reasons in my history to think that I was strongly inhibited with regard to anger and maybe it's just a fault. But I ended up thinking, no, actually what I think in my own life is actually right. And I found then these other people who, whom I strongly agreed with, Martin Luther King Jr. And I've written extensively now about his views on anger and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, who's one of my, my great, great heroes. They were not all of them. Some of them were against all force. Gandhi, of course, was a total pacifist and he was for total nonviolence. But I think that's not so much the issue because I do think there are just wars. The Second World War, I think, was a just war. And I do think there's a justifiable use of violence in self-defense. This is what Mandela and King uh, pretty much think. But they think it's the anger that's always poisonous and bad. So you can have non-anger without having total nonviolence. Mandela says that of the 27 years he spent in prison, a lot of that time was spent meditating about the problems that he had with anger because he really did want to destroy his enemies, but he couldn't do that. Now, what's, this, what's the alternative? The alternative is to keep the sense of protest, but then turn and face the future and say that had better not happen again. This is what I call transition anger because you turn and you transition to the future. Now that means that you don't want to inflict pain retributively. You might still use painful punishments to deter. And so there, there are plenty of uses for punishment in, in my view. But what Mandela rightly sees is you've got to preserve a sense of respect for your opposition if you're ever going to be able to fix the problem. And then, you know, King too, King, I mean, think about the I Have a Dream speech where he says, let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill in Mississippi. Now he has his sly dig at Mississippi in that phrase, but he really does mean that you've got to have freedom ringing even in the land of the opponents. And he wants people to be able to join together to make a new America. And this you don't have if you give way to retributive anger and just think destruction for its own sake. And of course, King was opposing the views of Malcolm X, which were retributive views. Mandela could never have created the modern South Africa if he had been a retributivist. He had to be able to see common ground with people whose actions he deeply deplored. And typically you do this by thinking there's a distinction between the deed and the doer. People always deserve some respect 
in an attempt at, at a kind of um, for King Christian love for Mandela and kind of Ubuntu, uh, and then you try to change their actions. Okay, okay, so that's what I had come to realize, and and I guess it's like going back back to myself and not being so sort of convinced by other people that anger is useful and productive. Great. Well, I think we should move on to, to what your future projects, but we should also encourage people to send in questions because we, we want to save yeah. some time at the end, some good time to answer other people's questions. Um, so hope, so um, could you uh, fill in, you know, for instance, the sexual violence the, the work yeah. on sexual violence and oh, animals. I'm glad you did that, that, that Fred mentioned that. Yes, it's um, it's published going to be published in May by Norton. I'm just going over the copy edits now, and uh, I'm excited about it. it. It's a book that really it's continuous with what I say because I want a, accountability. Well, the subtitle is sexual abuse, accountability, and reconciliation. So it's an attempt to get into this terrain of let's have transition anger and hold people to account, and let's find ways that law can do that, but without indulging in a kind of punitive mindset, which I do find is all too common these days. So, uh, so you know, probably a lot of people will think that I've sold feminism short if they think that feminism has to be retributive, but I do not. I think you could, you have greater strength when you're not retributive, retributivism is a kind of, I think it's a kind of weakness because it's selfish, it's kind of empty of content. But when you move ahead and you ask, how can we move forward in law? And so I look at various uh, areas. Where, so pride is in the title because I investigate the vice of pride as the vice in which some people think that they just are over, they're above other people, they don't have to take them seriously. They can treat them like objects. And so that's the, the core vice that we have to come to grips with. And I look at ways in which law has not been able to get on top of that phenomenon of pride. I look at the federal judiciary. I look at the arts. And I look at the world of college sports, especially in professional sports to some extent, but especially go after college sports, where I think that sexual abuse is encouraged by the very way in which the whole structure feeds an overweening pride and the objectification of women. So anyway, that's what that book is about. And, and all the while, I've been writing a, a bigger book, a long book, on the entitlements of non-human animals, tentatively called Justice for Animals, but it's due at the end of 2021, and then we'll see what we want to call it then. And uh, you know, I love doing this because there's so much wonderful research about it. so many different kinds of animals. Like in the last 20 years, we're learning more than we learned in the previous 500 years, partly because we can now go under the water and we can find what whales are doing. We can look at octopi and find what they're doing. And so I spend a lot of time just enjoying myself learning. But anyway, I'm trying to use a version of the capabilities approach to defend a new approach to the entitlements of non-human animals. And then, uh, you know, after that, I actually, I got so interested in the Britain War Requiem when I wrote this article that I now just signed a contract yesterday to do a, a monograph version of that. And uh, because I think it's an important work for our thinking about the body, about sexuality, and obviously about war, but about the future of nations and how reconciliation needs to be based on a kind of shared love of the body. So anyway, that, that's, that's a short book, but it will be the next one after that. Great, great. Um, looks like we have some questions. So let's go over here and take a look at them. Um, so. Okay, so I'm, I'm scrolling down. <laughs> okay, you just pick and read it out. Okay, and, uh, I'll, just, I'll just go at the top. It says, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, it says many philosophers have uh, classified Martha's approach to emotion as judgmentalist. I do not really agree with that view, and I suspect Martha does not agree with it either. Am I right? 
No, I don't agree with it at all. I think that's the result of reading chapter one of my book and not reading the other chapters. And I say that that chapter one is a crude sketch that will be modified later on. So they are unnoticed that they ought to read the other chapters. Uh, it's Robert Solomon had a judgmentalist view and he was a very important philosopher. And I think one should take his views extremely seriously. But my view is that you start with this stoic idea that emotions are forms of judgment, but that can't be the stopping place because it doesn't give us a way of thinking about the emotions of young human beings and of non-human animals. And it very importantly doesn't give us a diachronic view of the human emotions. We begin as infants not having the capacity to articulate or accept propositions, but then our emotions are very inchoate and they have very general objects. So I always have an evaluatively freighted perception, like an animal perceives this food as good and is motivated to move toward it. But, you know, that's a far cry from saying it's always a propositionally formulable judgment. And uh, so I explicitly reject that. Actually, there's a, a, an interview on the, journal, the online journal Emotion Researcher, which is a wonderful interview by a young emotion philosopher. It's called on um, love, justice, and something, and, and disgust, I guess. Anyway, you can look this up, Emotion Researcher Martha Nussbaum, and I go through all the, the different ways that I reject the judgmentalist view. Here's one I, I'm glad we're getting to. Um, you, uh, good afternoon, Professor Nesson. You seem to be saying that music can make assertions about su such subjects as war. I find this puzzling. What sort of assertions does a work like the 1812 Overture make about war? Well, you know, when I deal with music, um, I mean, I, it's just, I, I, I don't think that all literary works contain philosophical insights. I never would say such a thing. I think. Well, often they contain, contain no insight. I select the works and then I make a case for the work. Now in the case of music, I don't think you can ascribe very definite emotions to a work unless either it's a theatrical work like an opera and I'm a passionate opera fan. I write the program notes for Lyric Opera of Chicago, teach a course on opera, or a work that's in that neighborhood, like I've written about Mahler's song cycles and even the Mahler Second Symphony, where of course it's a programmatic work that has a text. Uh, so I think otherwise, you know, sometimes you could ascribe a general kind of emotion, like Jerry Levinson has a wonderful article about the Hebrides Overture of Mendelssohn expressing hope. But, you know, for me, those descriptions are always very difficult and they're likely to be quite global and vague. We could only get to something very concrete, like the Kindertoten leader expressing a certain view about the death of children, if we have a text that has the death of children in it. So the War Requiem, we of course have a very complicated work that was created with a certain purpose in mind, which purpose was to rededicate Coventry Cathedral after its destruction during World War II and it was uh, intended to promote, I mean, this is what Britain was asked to do, whether he did it or not, we can see, uh, promote reconciliation, not just uh, in Britain, but you know, all through the world. So he made sure that the singers were, there was a, his, his partner, Peter Piers, was the tenor, a German, Dietrich Fischer Disco, was the baritone, and a Russian. Galina Vishnevskaya was the soprano. Now, she wasn't allowed to get a visa, so she had to be replaced at the last minute. But that was his idea, was that the work itself, in the way that the singers participated in it, would express reconciliation. And he chose poetry of Wilfred Owen to complement the traditional Requiem Mass. And the way that he set the poems against the Mass express definite ideas that he had. They weren't always the same ideas that uh, Wilfred Owen had. Uh, actually, I think that Owen was not a total pacifist and Britain was, but that doesn't really come up because this work is 1962 and Britain had long gotten over fighting with the 
uh, the draft board about World War II. And it's really a, a terrain where he could agree with uh, people who think we need reconciliation and, no, and to avoid future wars, but we don't have to be a total pacifist. Uh, the big difference is that Wilfred Owen, in the poems that Britain shows, expresses some views that are quite dangerous for the future of Europe, such as contempt for women. He keeps contrasting the bodies of soldiers with the boring bodies of women and a, a definite class elitism. He expresses contempt in the poem called Insensibility, for example, for the common soldier who's brutish and not a poet, and we are the poets and so on. So, you know, Britain didn't select the works that were like that, or he edited them. And I show this in paper, he took out lines that he didn't like. And so he had a, a view that he was developing about a universal kind of forward movement toward reconciliation in Britain that would be built upon a sense that the human body is divine, if you will. I mean, Britain was a Christian. He was a, not a very you know, orthodox Christian in the sense that in those days, in 1962, he was looking ahead to the future of same-sex marriage. He had a lifelong partnership of over th it was about 38 years with Peter Pierce that was later treated like a marriage when he died in 1976. Queen Elizabeth, I must say, I give her great credit for this. She sent to Peter Pierce a letter of consolation as though he were the grieving spouse. But anyway, he wanted to talk about many kinds of reconciliation, the obvious kind between nations in war, but also the reconciliation between the British who persecuted gay men or same-sex relationships more generally, which was very recent. I mean, after all, Turing suicide was only a little while before that. And same-sex acts were made legal only after this work was premiered. So we, we had a, a nation that was undergoing a about same-sex relationships. And there's a pivotal part of the work, which is the Agnes Day movement, which is in a way the, the center of the mass, where the poem of Owen, One Ever Hangs Where Shelled Roads Part, is sung in very naked and pure tenor line, where the beautiful voice of Peter Pierce rings out. And I mean, the love letters of Britain and Pierce are public property of the nation now. And they, Britain is always saying, you know, I, I love you, but you know, it's your voice. That I, I, I view as the heart of you, this wonderful musical voice. And uh, I mean, they're very funny because Piers is a little bit more earthy in his utterances than Britain. But anyway, the beautiful voice of Piers, which is earthy, I mean, that the, the timbre of his tenor voice was very earthy, expresses these views of how the Christ is being sacrificed by the makers of war. So in a way, he's portrayed as the murdered Christ. And Christ, therefore, is seen as a thoroughly human body, and not only human, but a, a gay man, if you will. And so all of these different things are going on in the work, which includes, of course, the casting of the work and the voices that sing the work. And, and, and so, I, you know, I don't think you can always make claims, but I defend my claims about this work. And, and it's a long issue with Britain because even when he was a schoolboy, he got tossed out of school for writing about the rights of animals. And he wrote an essay attacking hunting and they, threw, they refused to allow him to graduate with that graduation essay. Uh, and later he wrote a work called Our Hunting Fathers, where he compares the hunting that Brit Britons love, hunting of foxes, with the hunting of people. It was Auden who wrote the libretto, and the hunting, the persecution of the Jews was at the heart of this work. So all different kinds of hunting and persecution of the body were of enormous interest to him. So anyway, that's some of the stuff that I think I can 
justifiably ascribed to the work, but I would never, 1812 Overture, I don't know, you know, Tchaikovsky is such a very complicated composer because he was so convoluted and so at war with himself. I've never seriously worked on Tchaikovsky, and therefore I don't dare to say whether the overt patriotism of that overture should be thought of as sincere or a facade. And of course, he gave a lot of reasons to think that a lot of what he wrote expressed his own inner conflict over sexuality. But I don't, I won't go there. I don't know enough about Tchaikovsky. Okay, let's go to this one. Um, how do you differentiate between a search for justice through punishments by the legal and judiciary system and retribution? Well, of course, there are famously different views of punishment. Uh, one of them is the retributive view, namely punishment is justified by, because it exacts retrospective payback. The other most prominent one is the deterrent view. Punishment is justified because it deters. And then within that, there are two varieties. There's specific deterrence. It deters that offender from committing another bad act in the future. But there's also general deterrence. It puts other people on notice that this is a bad thing to do. And then there's one that I particularly like in combination with the deterrence view, which is the moral education view of punishment, saying that punishment is, you know, it, what you punish educates the society. When young people grow up, they attend to legal punishments. And I, I think if we think about sexual harassment, which was not punished when I was in graduate school, and now it is punished, uh, you know, exactly. That punishment, I think most of the people who used to commit sexual harassment were not double-dyed villains. They were just clueless. They had no idea what this did to women. And now they're educated and they see. So it has a forward-looking purpose. So I think that you can have plenty of punishment with no retribution. Great. Um, how about this? Would you comment on multidimensional welfare as related to the capabilities approach? Well, of course, the whole point, as I, as I said, one point of attacking GDP is the distributional point. But the other point was the multidimensional point that you want to say welfare is plural. And this is why I always prefer the term capabilities approach to some people use the word capability approach because I think the plural is always worth keeping in mind. Uh, when people say, how do you get trade-offs, costs and benefits and so on, I want to say, no, all these things are essential. It's like our Bill of Rights. You don't make trade-offs between freedom of speech freedom of religion. You try to have both. And of course, as you try to have both, you have to think what reasonable threshold can we set. We can't maybe educate everyone up through postgraduate school at government expense if we're also going to have an adequate health care system. So the, the different dimensions have to be held together as we think of a reasonable set of capabilities that we can hope to fulfill. But they're all different, and, and we, we don't trade them off one against another. Now, of course, that means it's much more difficult to measure. And this is the Achilles heel. People always like simple things, and they want to think first, what can I measure here and now? And then they work back from that to what's important. I would rather work in the other direction. I, I, it, you see it all over the place. You see it in many different parts of philosophy, what I call the fallacy of measurement. You, Working back what you can measure to what you think is important. But anyway, you know, think what's important, find some way of measuring that. Education is very hard because what the human development reports use is mean years of schooling as reported by the nations. Now, I mean, this is not totally worthless, but it comes close because you can't rely on the nations really to tell the truth. So in our association, we have a lot of studies that are a lot better than that. But even years of schooling, you need to know much more about what's going on in the classroom. You measure the real education of a human being. And of course, these are all questions that we discuss. But then we need to do it. We need to get in there and do it. And of course, healthcare famously is plural. We might be doing well on one dimension, but doing terribly on other dimensions. 
the United States ranks very low on infant mortality and maternal mortality, largely because of race-based race inequalities in, in those areas. But anyway, yes, I mean, even the notion of health is obviously a plurality. And any great health economist like Angus Deaton will begin by saying health is not a single thing. So the multidimensional is sort of obvious because you know very well if, you, if somebody asks me, how, how are you doing? I would not just think of one number. I would think, well, you know, there's this pandemic that's affecting the lives of a lot of people I care about. But then there's the fact that one can still work. And, you know, you would think of lots of different things and they're not commensurable with one another. But if some psychologist says, oh, I want a number between one and 10 reporting your happiness at time T, then you'll be bludgeoned and bullied into giving a single answer. But that isn't what you really think. Thank you. There's the incommensurability. It goes back to the tragic, you know, the tragic stuff and the fragility of goodness, right? The, the quest for commensurability can really cover up for Oh, that's a great point. Yes, thank you for that point. Yeah, I mean, you, you find characters in these tragedies who don't want to face a conflict of incommensurable values. Now, in the Antigone, of course, famously, you have a conflict of incommensurable values. Antigone's concern for the religion, the duties of family religion, which order her to bury her brother, and the well-being of the state, which suggests that a traitor must not be buried. But both Creon and Antigone have a way of simplifying the terrain of value so that Creon redefines what family is to make it just a little part of the state. Antigone has a way of redefining the state or sort of almost defining it out of existence so that it just becomes subordinate to family religion. Now, this is something that Hegel saw long ago when I, I'm really on board with Hegel here. He said, if you face the conflict, as these protagonists don't, then you are able to ask a much more significant question than they ask, namely, what form of society could make it possible for people not to face that tragic conflict between religion and the state all the time? And he thought, not without reason, that the modern liberal state, which protects freedom of religion, but also, you know, finds a way of working the safety of the state into it, has done much better than the ancient cities did. So, you know, I think the Hegelian question is always the right way to proceed. Is there a future we can imagine where these things that cause tragedy now do not cause tragedy any longer? We're not going to be able to eliminate all of the tragedies because these are incommensurable values, but we can we can make a lot of progress. And so it's not the case that I, I fear my wonderful teacher, Bernard Williams, thought that tragedies give us the bad news that there's nothing much we can do. I don't think that way. I think they give us news that we better get to work and see what, how far we can eliminate these problems. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I, this person says, I lead a research program on modernizing Congress. The COVID emergency distance rules for participation have surprised me in a good way. The intentionality of member interaction with each other is now mandatory for the institutional process. My question for you, do you think there is a way to re-incentivize productive mutual participation among our leaders as a silver lining of COVID measures? Do our democratically elected leaders have the trust or legitimacy for this without an accompanying cultural change of heart? Well, you know, I think the obvious problem is that the whole culture is so permeated now with the kind of, um, you know, maybe it's because of social media, maybe it's something else. The idea that you score points by humiliating somebody else. And so it's like an argument is like a zero sum game rather than a search for progress of the mind, mutual illumination, and so forth. Uh, you know, you find it, of course, even in the university, where people think they, they, they're going to put somebody else down, and diss somebody, or cancel somebody. And 
uh, I mean, the students come, University of Chicago has always been famous, and I think rightly, for defending civilized debate and freedom of speech. That's our theory, and that's what I think we try to practice. But when these students come in, and they come from undergraduate institutions that don't have that attitude, and they are part of a kind of cancel culture, it's very hard to get them not to stir things up in a bad way. So with my Bear Gruen money, one thing I did, I gave it to several different charitable institutions, but the part I gave to the law school was to set up just a program, they're called Nussbaum Lunches, where we get groups of students, no more than 15, with two faculty members who have contrasting views on a topic. And these are all law students, so they're older. And we spend an hour and a half together talking about that problem and their ground rules and so on. But that works amazingly well, because if I just taught a class, you see, and I wanted to get the people to do this in the classroom, the problem is that right now people vote with their feet and only the people who sort of agree with me will take a class from me. And I think this is terrible. The most conservative member of our law school faculty took feminist philosophy for me because he really wanted to learn, you know, but that doesn't happen anymore. And so the only way to engineer it is to have a smaller time slot. So an hour and a half, we can really make progress on things like, oh, you know, the bakery cases and same sex uh, marriages and so on. We really did, I think we, we made progress. I always do this with a, a liberal, well, he's really not a conservative, he's more of a libertarian, Will Bode, who's a wonderful, gentle presence, and we have a very good rapport, and we can get the students to see that we trust each other, and they then come to trust us and one another, and even in an hour and a half, we, we can do that. And I guess I think that's, you know, that's a microcosm. You have to start where you are and try to hope that as you replicate respect and concern for accurate accuracy and respectful argument, it will spread out. And, uh, you know, Congress, I think it's very hard because when people go back to their constituents, it's not always that that they're being rewarded for. I really love it when, I mean, I don't know very many Congress people, but if I have some who really stand for that kind of respectful interaction, uh, I really want to give them special shout out. And um, I mean, one that I do know is a local uh, woman who's, who won in a Republican district, and she's a Democrat, but she's really on the middle, as it were. Lauren Underwood, a very wonderful African-American woman who was a nurse. And I've kind of helped her campaign by hosting a fundraiser because I think she illustrates this kind of fact-based, science-based, argument-based, respectful interaction. And that's how she won because these people in the suburbs, that's where she is, they, you know, the district voted overwhelmingly for Trump, but they voted for her because she listened and she took them seriously and she argued. And there are other individuals of both parties that I would mention, you know, there's certainly plenty of, of former, I don't know if there's still Republicans that I, I think are trying to make the discourse richer and more diverse. I think George Will, whom I've followed with interest for a long time, I was actually supposed to have a public debate with George Will in October at Cornell, but I think we got to postpone it now. But anyway, you know, I think someone like that shows the capacity to listen, to make up his mind, and not just to have the knee-jerk reaction. But, you know, he's a columnist, so he can do what he wants. It's much harder in Congress, and I, and I just hope that people will keep working on that and make it happen. I think we have time for one more, it looks like. Um, so this is uh, Professor Nussbaum. Thank you so much for your time and thoughtfulness this afternoon. Drawing on your concept of anger, what implications does your theory hold for, for instance, calls for reparations to Black Americans as part of a larger national reckoning about the role of race in American history? Yeah, well, this is a, an excellent question. Of course, reparations can be defended in a variety of ways, and I think the retributive way isn't all that promising when you think of it because the people who did the bad things 
are not the same people who are paying the money. I mean, our population has changed so much over the century through immigration and so on. Well, somebody whose family immigrated from India, why should they be paying as though they did something bad? Um, and, and, and of course, the people who are receiving the funds are not the same either. Some of them are immigrants and so on. I think the whole question is going forward, how can we achieve both correction of the problems that so massively exist, and then a kind of spirit of love and reconciliation. And maybe, you know, I think the renaming of monuments has great symbolic power to achieve that within limits. I think the naming, renaming the Fort Bragg is a no-brainer no because why should you name a fort for a traitor in the first place? But anyway, there you know there are big questions about this. We have had a long debate here in Chicago about uh, the Stephen Douglas Park, which is very near where I live, actually. And people have said, "Oh, you know, so easy to put one more S on it, and it can be the Frederick Douglas Park." And I think that's a pretty good one too, because you know Stephen Douglas, defender of slavery. Uh, going forward, that's not a name that helps us. But you know, it, it's piece by piece. I don't think we should take down every every monument. And I, I guess the, the, the question to ask about money is what what would be the source of this money? It's got to come from taxes somehow. So what is it taking away from? The national budget is a certain sum. And if you designate part of it for reparations, what are you not using that money for? And then, you know, what is the money actually doing? I guess my thought is the real crying need of communities of color in this country is better access to health and education. And I'd be much happier with a, a kind of scheme for reparations that tried to remedy those terrible defects that, I mean, I see it just down the street from me. Lack of access to fresh food and produce, lack of access to health care. Well, we're trying to help with that. We've opened a trauma center at the University of Chicago Hospital this year. But see, I think those are the things that where people's lives are suffering. And education, particularly, you know, what are you going to really do about not just elementary education, but then access to university education? If I thought that there was some uh, connection from the giving of cash to the solving of those real problems, I'd be happier with it. But so far, well, somebody needs to make a proposal and then we can evaluate it. Thank you. I think uh, we should probably stop uh, right there and hand it back over to the people at the library. <laughs> I want to thank you, Brian. I really, it's great to see you. I hope I can see you in beautiful Asheville before long. Uh, but thank you and, and thanks again, Fred and Molly, and thanks to the library for this uh, hosting this event. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nussbaum, for this wonderful presentation. Dr. Butler, thank you for guiding us through today's event. Fred and Molly, once again, thank you for your generosity and your continuing support for the past 11 years and into the future. And for all of you attending today, thank you for attending the sixth biennial Kellogg Lecture on Jurisprudence. To learn about the Law Library's news event, new events, please visit our Legal Research Institute website. That's at loc.gov slash law slash learning. That's loc.gov slash law slash learning. You can follow the Law Library on Twitter and Facebook, and you can subscribe to our email alerts at loc.gov slash subscribe, so you can keep up with new, our news and events. I'd like to take this opportunity to announce and invite you to join us at our next event, the 2020 Constitution Day on September 17th. The Law Library will host Michael J. Murphy, a historical publication specialist in the Office of the Historian for the U.S. House of Representatives. He will discuss the lives of the first African-American members of Congress, 
His presentation is entitled, The Bulwark of Freedom, African American Members of Congress and the Constitution During Reconstruction. We also hope to see many of you and that you will visit our virtual booth at this year's National Book Festival that will take place from September 25th through 27th. This year, uh, because of the crazy events that we find ourselves in, uh, the National Book Festival will be all virtual for those three days. Dr. Nussbaum and Dr. Butler, once again, thank you for being with us today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you all.